Howdy folks, Rudros here and welcome to Lorcana Wednesday. With Ursula Return coming out this Friday officially for its pre-release, I thought I'd take a time to look over some of the new cards. In the past I have done a full set review, but <laughs> due to low viewership and also just I think they're very lengthy, I just don't think it's worth it to do that. Plus there's a lot of cards that are blank or just I don't honestly even think are worth talking about, so I thought it would be a little more interesting. Let's talk about the six legendary, or sorry, yeah, the legendaries we get from each of the six inks. So we have a total of 12. Usually legendaries are going to be your very strong, powerful cards, or at least they tend to have unique effects that your more common cards do not. Does this set live up to that? Well, we're going to find out. Something you might hear me say a lot over these is that there is a lot of potential within these cards, but I also think a lot of these cards are going to struggle to hit that potential, so we'll see if that holds up or not. All right, let's jump right into it with our first one. This is Cinderella, Melody Weaver. I'll go ahead and read their stats off too since we're only doing 12 cards a day. So she's a five cost inkable. Cinderella, Melody Weaver, one attack, five defense. She's a singer nine, so she can sing almost any song in the game, I think other than the new, is it second start of the right? There might be one that's a 10 as well besides that, but can sing almost any song in the game. And then... Beautiful voice. Whenever this character sings a song, your other princess characters get plus one lore this turn. And she has two lore herself. So the stats are okay. One five isn't great. Rapunzel has those, and Rapunzel is one cheaper. Rapunzel also has the two lore. So statistically, she's a Rapunzel that costs one more. Now, Singer 9 is very strong in the sense that she can just sing anything by herself. But I wonder what kind of songs you're looking to sing with her. I feel like it has to be the new Sing Together ones, right? The ones that are seven or higher because the old, like the Sing Song deck, the Ariel could already sing Whole New World and Grab Your Swords, which were two of really the main targets in that deck. Unless you're running this with Red and you want her to sing Be Prepared, I'm, I'm not sure, like specifically... That's the only thing I can I can that's the only song I can think of between the five cost steel ones and the really high sing together ones that would be worth doing. She can sing the new uh, Madrigal song was it Look at Our Family. That's pretty solid. So I mean the singer singer is always a good trait. That's pretty good. However, she literally does nothing the turn she's played. She just comes in and sits there a whole turn and then she has to sing. Now, the whole princess package has been an idea since set one. It's never really evolved into a competitive deck, but you could give something that, uh, what is it, that Moana from set one, that quest for three and like it readies the other princesses. Suddenly she's questing for four. Uh, you know, other princesses, your bell now, maybe instead of just questing for five, suddenly she's questing for six. And it gives them the lore, so maybe there's like a yellow-blue deck you could put this in, where you use that bell. Bell now has six lore, and you can dime her and quest with her. Boom, 12 lore out of nowhere. Sounds pretty good, but again, you have to have a song, and you she doesn't do anything the turn she comes in, which is pretty important in a tempo-based game. So I, there's clearly potential with this card. I don't know if this even goes in Steel Song, because usually you want the baby Cinderella, and then you're going to shift into the bigger one. This one can't shift or anything like that. And again, I don't recall that deck. There has been no song that that deck has thought, man, if only I could sing this. I just don't have a singer high enough. So unless the new Sing Together songs with the top end are, are so, end up being so great that you just, you, ha you really want this Cinderella to sing it alone. My current vote is that I don't think this is going to see much play. I think it's a cool idea but I think it's a bit slow and there are better things to do. However, it does make me want to try a princess deck around it. So I will do that. As with all these cards, I always hope I'm wrong if I tend to grade them low because I love to see cards do well and I love to see them exceed my own expectations. But just reading it, looking at it, this doesn't seem very impressive. Next, we have Mickey Mouse, the Musketeer Captain. He is a seven cost uninkable with a three attack, six uh, defense stat line. He is a Floodborne, so he has Shift, of course, as all the Floodborns do. It's a Shift of 5. He also has both Bodyguard and Support, 2 Lore, and Musketeers United. When you play this character, if you use Shift to play him, you may draw a card for each character with Bodyguard you have in play. I have been wanting to do Bodyguard since the game first came out way back in I, Chapter 1. I think mine was Amber Steel, but it was all around the bodyguards and using them to protect like Lilo and all those really low questers. I thought that deck was really fun. It used the Musketeers Tabard to draw cards as they expired, even though that card's like way overpriced, especially two sets later. It was overpriced probably in set one. So I love the idea of this Mickey Mouse, but 
on first read, I think this looks pretty bad. Here's why. So cost seven, very expensive, and it's uninkable. Uninkables are just always an instant downgrade, no matter what the card is. Uh, some of them are worth it, but I don't think this one is. So the stat line, he has the same stats as Goofy. He costs two more than Goofy, and Goofy can be inked. <laughs> and he has the exact, like, I, I cannot believe his stats are that low for this seven cost uninkable. Yeah, he has support, but his support is worse than Maximus, who supported for four. And support in general just has not been a keyword that has made any waves in the competitive scene, and I don't see anything that is going to change that now, because it just requires a, a lot, right? So the turn he comes in, unless he was shifted in, he can act immediately, where he can quest, and he has, specifically he has to quest, so he can't even like challenge something. He has to quest to give support, to give to something else, which means you have to have other things in play. So support's just never been a big deal. Now, the good news is, for his on-entry effect, he counts himself as a bodyguard, so at minimum, he will always at least draw one card. And if you have other bodyguards on the field, so best case scenario, right? You get Simba out turn two, you get, is there a turn three bodyguard? Oh, the Prince, is that, yeah, the Prince, you could get him out. Turn four, put down something like Little John, you've got three. Here comes Mickey, which I don't know which Mickeys you could shift, which would mean you'd have to have a Mickey on turn one. So let's, let's say, I'm not sure which Mickey you're shifting this onto, but let's say, so you've got two other bodyguards, he comes in you draw three cards immediately. That is very good. That, you know, a three card draw is good. But we also have a card called Rapunzel, which can do that with other combos too and doesn't require quite so much setup. And I would like him a lot better if, why is that effect tied to shifting him? So if you just play him for seven, it just does nothing. <laughs> I mean, you can exert him as a bodyguard, but that, why can't, I have no idea why that effect requires him to be shifted. If anything, it seems like it should be switched that like, hey, you can either get the discount of the shift and and then you get to play him way sooner, or if you're willing to wait, you get this much bigger payoff. I would have redesigned this card. Like, I think the idea is good, but I think the stats are too weak for the cost. I would have rather have seen this at a lower cost with a lower shift, and then I would have flipped the text. So maybe you can shift him in on turn three, and he's a really good early bodyguard, but he's just the shift. Whereas here, if you wait and play him normally at what would be should have been like five cost, then you get to draw for all the bodyguards. So I, I like the idea of the card. It is really cool. I will try a bodyguard deck because I'm wanting to make that work forever. And maybe, maybe just maybe that shift onto himself for the card draw is going to be worth it. But it it sounds like all these hoops you're going to have to draw, all these hoops you're going to have to jump through when other cards already exist to give you a similar amount of value, just like more straightforward. So not feeling Mickey right now. Next, we'll move on to Amethyst. Ursula, Sea Witch Queen. She costs seven, four attack, seven defense. Also, a Floodborne can shift five, has three lore, which is very nice. Now I am the ruler. Whenever this character quests, exert a chosen character. That's quite good. And you'll listen to me. Other characters can't exert to sing songs, which is situational right so one thing to note it says other characters it doesn't just say opposing characters so she actually prevents your own characters from singing songs now obviously in Lorcana you can sequence cards however you wish so if you have a song you want to sing that turn you can just do it before you play the Ursula but the moment she hits the field you've cut yourself off from that now preventing others from singing songs is Again, in, against the right deck, that's huge. If you're going against a Steel Song deck, if you're going against the Green Ursula who wants to double sing all of her songs, that's super strong if you can just cut that out entirely. But what if they're not running any songs? What if they're an item-heavy deck or, yeah, an aggro deck that just doesn't have a bunch of songs that literally doesn't do anything? Uh, the questing is nice that you can just exert a character. Granted, it does require you to have a follow-up to do something while that character is exerted and have a Maui or something else to come clean up the card you've exerted but it's clearly a good effect it's repeatable there's no like stipulation to it it just does it so i think this card looks good i'll be honest i'm not sure where it goes i mean it is a three lore quester maybe it just fits in ruby amethyst and it's it's actually an inkable card unlike the old ursula so granted that one i mean i guess you could play one of the new ursulas to shift it onto or maybe the uninkable one from last set probably not though so I don't know, and that's the other thing too, if you're not shifting this, and that's kind of my issue with a lot of their design with all these shift cards, you can think of that with the Mickey in the last one. If you aren't shifting these, 
they feel so much weaker. Like if it gets to your turn seven, which is be prepared territory, right? Sometimes you need to be prepared seven because your opponent's going that quick. And and you, your entire turn is seven ink, put down this Ursula, and that's it. I mean, yeah, you've immediately stopped any songs coming out, but I don't know. It's as though she seems a lot stronger when she shifts. Sh sh when, blah, 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 when she shifts, she seems a lot weaker if you just have to play her raw on seven. So... I don't know. I wasn't overly impressed when I first saw this. I, uh, maybe there's some combo I'm not thinking of that someone can use to kind of break her. I wouldn't be surprised because she does have potentially very potent text. Currently, I'm going to kind of put her just in the like middle category, mid-range. Just like, eh, she seems like she's got potential. I just don't know if she's going to get there with it. Next, we have Yen Sid, the powerful sorcerer. He is a two-cost, 1-3 uh, stat line. Uh, quest for one, when you play this character, if you have a character named Magic Broom in play, you can draw a card, and then while you have two or more Broom characters in play, this character gets plus two lore. He seems really good. I, you know, he's so low to the ground, but I like that. We have a new Broom that you can play on one. I think it's an Amethyst Broom. So you could make an aggressive line. You play that Broom turn one. You play this one turn two, you get to draw off of it. That feels really good to play a two cost that draws a card. And then he kind of acts like a piglet in that way that on turn three, if you can play a third broom, suddenly he's questing for three just like piglet. So yeah, that's neat. It's it's very neat, low to the ground. It's not, it doesn't really have like continuous value in the sense that, yes, as, as long as you have brooms, he's getting more lore. But it's not like, oh, by bringing in a bunch of brooms, he continues to do more and more things. It's just, well, no, he'll always have that lore value. And... His stats are insanely low. He has the stats of a one-cost card. He has the same stats as Olaf. So chances are he's going to die very quickly. But I think if you're playing Brooms and you can get that combo off, Broom, Yen Sid draw, next Broom, Yen Sid quest for three. I think he's, he's, he's more than done his job. He has drawn you a card and given you three lore. Even if he dies right after that, I think you're more than happy with that. And if he doesn't die that's another three lore you're potentially threatening every turn assuming you can keep the brooms around so yeah he's cool uh obviously very specific you have to play him with that broom package uh, that can always be a hair disappointing for a legend when they're so specialized like that but he's neat he's low to the ground and he's inkable like he's is yeah he seemed for what he's going for i actually think yen said is one of the better legendaries in this set and will be very good if you can line up that one two three play next we have diablo moving on to emerald this one is interesting. I've kind of gone back and forth on it. So it's a three cost, uninkable. It's a two, two stat line, only quest for one. It does have shift, but you can't shift in the traditional sense. You have to shift to discard an action card. He also has evasive and he has a pretty good effect. Circle far and wide during each opponent's turn. Whenever they draw a card while he's exerted, you also get to draw a card. So that includes their natural draw for turn and any additional draws they may do. So his effect is clearly good. How good is the card overall? Like a lot of these shift cards, he's... I think that if you can shift him, the stronger he is. So what you can do is you can play the new Diablo, turn one. Because this shift doesn't actually cost ink, turn two, you could play like a Bucky and then still shift this on, even though you've spent two ink on Bucky because this doesn't cost ink. So you discard your action card. You shift him on. He's a Floodmore and he triggers Bucky. They immediately discard on turn two. Then he can quest immediately, and now he's getting you value back every turn that they draw. So if you can get him out early and keep him exerted and keep getting value, he's going to be great. Like, that's so much power. What are the downsides? Well, he's uninkable. Two, that combo requires you see one Diablo, Diablo one, this Diablo, a Bucky. I mean, not that you have to have Bucky. And then, but an action card to shift him. Like, at the very minimum, you need both Diablos and specifically an action card that you're willing to get rid of. And then if he can, again, if he can stick around, he gets you insane value. He's going to draw you so many cards just by existing. Luckily, he is evasive, so it's going to be difficult for them to challenge into him. However, as a 2-2, if you're going against Steel, I mean, ba-boom, fire the cannons, grab your sword, smash, anything is going to get rid of this guy. And as we talked about earlier, like the difference between turn two you go first you play the first one turn two you can shift him on immediately quest he immediately draws you a card on your opponent's turn even if they can deal with him that turn he at least gets you a card first that feels worth it however if you have to turn three your entire turn is you play diablo then turn four if he's still alive quest with him then you'll get your first card draw off of him that is so much slower and 
I think he won't feel nearly as good doing that. But if you can get that consist consistent shift early, this guy can get you a lot of value. So again, it just falls in this potential category of when it's going to work, it's going to feel great. And then when you have to take the slower route, eh, maybe not so much. That being said, if you're not playing against Steel and they don't have a ton of removal, he's going to be great because he's just going to stick around with that evasive. However, with new cards like Brawl, Madame Medusa, that there are more and more things that just pop this guy. A kick Cloud Kicker in his own element can just boop, pop him back to your hand. That's going to feel really bad. So, yeah, he, he's going to be one I'm definitely going to have my eyes on because I could see him being an absolute terror. That's a pain in the butt to deal with, but I could also see he it's too difficult to line up that dream scenario so then it just kind of falls off. Next, we have Hades, the double dealer. Hades, one of my favorite Disney villains. His art is like, so I like the style of the art. It's very captivating. My one quibble with it is why are there two versions of Meg in the pool of souls there? That, I, I don't even know, like, how does that even make sense? Is it just because, like, oh, he's a double dealer, so we'll put double Meg? I don't know. Or they just wanted a character you recognize, but it's very weird that you can see Meg twice. Is he, like, is he draining the life from the one to r create another version of her? I mean, I guess that fits in with his theme. Anyway, whatever. So, he's a four-cost, inkable, that's good. 3-3 three, three stat line, meh, okay. And then, here's the trade-off. His ability, he quests for one lore. You exert him, banish one of your other characters, play a character with the same name as the banished character for free. Now, on reading this, I think this sounds insanely, insanely weak. Granted, effects like this, and notice it's not limited to like once per turn, so if you could ready him, you could essentially repeat it. Usually, effects like this always find their way into some silly combo infinite loop kind of thing eventually. I don't know if that's what's going to happen here. So on entry, he does absolutely nothing. Then you have to wait a whole turn, and then he, you can't attack with him, you can't quest with him, you have to exert him to do this effect. And I'm just trying to think, You, the only characters I can think that I would actively want to banish is something that has like an on-death effect. So the first thing that came to mind was Prince Eric in Ruby last set. So when he dies, he gets to banish another thing as well. So you could quest with the Eric, use this effect banish him outright, break whatever you want, and then you play the next Eric from your hand, right? However, you that also means you have to have another Eric in hand. So you had to have an Eric on the field and then Hades and then another copy of Eric in the hand. And that's, like, there's just all these moving parts that, so you have to have an additional copy of the character and the Hades ready to exert. And then beyond Eric, like, would you really want to do this to your own Curse Merfolk? Like, so let's say you quest with Curse Merfolk yeah, you could banish it, replace it from hand. Well, it's not exerted, but you want them to attack the Cursed Merfolk. You want them to have to give a card up for it. And why get rid of something that, like, what if they can't answer it to just play another copy? You can just play the next copy anyway. So the only way I really see this scene play is, again, if there's a very specific effect like Eric or like something I haven't even considered that, oh, man, when this dies, like Mufasa maybe. Okay, you quest with Mufasa. But even then... You want to make your opponent essentially spend some of their resources and some of their turn actions to get rid of your Mufasa. You don't want to just willingly get rid of him for yourself. So maybe there's some combo out there that I'm, and again, I haven't thought of off the top of my head, or that just doesn't even exist yet. And maybe in the future, something will come out if we ever get. There's other cards in other games, like there's a card called Goomba in FF that when it dies, you can go search out another copy from the deck. If we ever get something like that, this could obviously be very, very strong. But as it is right now, this seems uh, pretty bad. Moving on to Ruby with Mulan, Elite Archer. Another card with insane potential, but will that potential be realized? So she's a six-cost Inkimal. That's good. Two-six stat line. That's not good. Uh, shift of five. Quest for two. Straight shooter. When you play this character, if you use shift to play her, she gets plus three attack this turn. Then obviously triple shot during your turn. Whenever this character deals damage to another character in a challenge, deal the same amount of damage up to two other chosen characters. So the ceiling on this card at its best potential, which is obviously on turn five, you shift her in. She gains three attack. She challenges something and kills it for five and shoots two other things for five and blows up three characters in one go fantastic that is absolutely incredible and, and an insane removal spell 
However, all those things have to line up. So you have to have the lower Mulan. You have to be able to shift on five. That part's not as complicated. You know, you're probably building your deck around that. Uh, the straight shooter only triggers if she comes in on a shift, which is what gives her a lot of attack. And then they have to obviously have not only something that can be challenged, but other targets that you'd want to take out too. Is that now, here's the thing. Is that power play enough to make her see play? I think it might be. Taking out three characters and hopefully, ideally, keeping your character alive as well. Like, you could take out a Maui without actually challenging it. You challenge something else for five, Maui only has five at health, so you can shoot the Maui without ever even needing to engage with it, which is really cool. So, I think the potential on this card is through the roof. It kind of sucks. Again, if you play her just on six regularly, she doesn't do anything. And then she's only attacking for two, which, unless you're going against aggro, is insanely, insanely weak. If on turn seven, she's finally getting to attack in and pick off stuff, that's only really going to matter for aggro. So, like, all these cards, it does kind of bug me. They make them so focused on the shift. Like, the shift is what makes them strong, and beyond that, they're kind of eh. But that high end, that potential seems so, so good. Will it end up being worth the trouble? I don't know. Ruby has a lot of tight slots as is, all, especially if it's compared with blue or uh, purple. Like those decks are already very tight on their slots. And this is demanding not only a Mulan, but a target for her to shift onto. And to see that reliably, you're basically asking for eight slots right there. Eight of this new Mulan and eight of one of the smaller Mulans to shift onto. So that's asking a lot of slots. Uh, that being said, it could potentially replace something like Scar. Scar, who is uninkable and has to wait all the way till 7. Granted, he doesn't need as much setup. So I I'm very hopeful for this. I've got my fingers crossed for this card because I think the idea is really, really cool. And if the meta ends up going very small and fast, which I don't think it will, this could be a really good counter to it. But... I'm also worried, just like with a lot of these, that it's asking so many steps and conditions that it might not be worth it. But I'm going to put this one a little on the higher end because I think I think this one is a little more feasible to get off more regularly. Let's hope so. Next in Ruby, we have Sisu, Empowered Sibling. She is an 8-cost, uninkable, blech. 5-4 uh, stat line, quest for 3 shift of six and then she has the action of or the ability i got this when you play this character banish all opposing characters with two strength or less so unlike a lot of these other shift cards this one at least does not have to shift to get her effect off you can just play this for eight and then boom you hit them that's great that part i love three lore is also really nice uh, uninkable is not great, but I understand this one. I at least understand why it's uninkable because it does tech technically have a board wipe effect. Um, her stats are wretched. I, if they didn't want her to be like a huge attacker, I would have much rather had her be like four attack. Like I don't, you don't want to go lower than four because I don't want her to die to Madame Medusa and then give her God, at least six defense, if not seven, like she could have been a four. So she costs eight, you know, Elsa was a four, six, give her, give her, give her minimum six defense the shift doesn't matter as much other than just questing immediately and the effect is just insanely situational in in a way you if, if the situation lines up if everything on their board is two or less this is better than be prepared right because it's a one-sided board wipe it can't be pulled out of your hand by an ursula or bare necessities or anything that targets songs or actions it's a character which is a very protected class of card right now so if if they're playing aggro or they're playing something that just has entirely tiny attack power this is a one-sided board wipe which is insane how often is that going to line up uh, specifically on turn eight or even turn six you know, if you're playing against aggro, usually you've kind of stabilized by that point. Uh, where I, I feel like more likely than not, you're going to see so many cards that have three attack or higher at that point. So I, I don't have high hopes for this just because it's so expensive. And again, other than specifically against an aggro deck that's naturally going to have low attack power, it seems like this is just going to... Yeah, it's going to... It, it, how, how much is this really going to hit? Because if you're playing eight to get rid of a single card, eh, that doesn't feel so good. Like I said, red, purple decks are already so tight on slots as is, as is uh, blue, red. And I just think be prepared is going to be a more reliable option. I would love to see Sisu work. You could also 
combine her with something that lowers attack power. So maybe you're doing uh, Amber, Ruby, and you do it with Akita. And Akita reduces all their attack power, and then Sisu comes in and boom, knocks them out. Or the Triton we're going to talk about soon, where he has kind of this blanket effect to reduce their attack power. If you could consistently pull that off, now she's insane that you essentially are wiping the whole board regardless of how strong they really are because you've got all these reducing effects. That sounds awesome. How much is that going to line up? Like, how competitive is that going to be? Probably not going to happen. So I will be surprised to see this C play, but she's one I'd absolutely love to be wrong about. Next, we're going to go into Sapphire, my personal favorite ink color, and we have the Queen the Diviner. She's a three-cost inkable with a 3-3 three, three stat line. I mean, that's fine. What was the one that had 3-3 three, three earlier? It was uh, Hades, yeah. So she costs one less and does, uh, and, and she has the same stat line. I don't get that. I, I mean, I know these cards also have different effects and everything, but still, that's just kind of funny. Yeah, she costs one less and has the exact same stat line as Hades. Anyway, consult the spell book. She only quests for one lore, but you're mainly going to be using her for her ability. You can exert her. Look at the top four cards of your deck. You may reveal an item card and put it into your hand. If that item costs three or less, you may play it for free instead, and it enters play exerted. Put the rest on the bottom of your deck in any order. This is a really interesting card with a lot of potential. So if you're playing blue, usually on turn three, you're looking to do something like Fishbone Quill or maybe even Heart of Tefiti. So if you took that turn off to play this instead, you're technically slowing down your ramp by a little bit, but then maybe she gets you an entirely free Fishbone Quill that just cheats into play. Granted, it's exerted, so you can't use it right away. But I think even if she hits something cheap, like if she pulls out a Popsicle and just plays Popsicle for free that you didn't even have to spend the one ink on... And now she essentially says, exert herself, pull one of the top four cards, goes into play, and you draw another card. That's got to seem really worth it. Uh, any items beyond that, something like Scrooge's Top Hat, uh, Heart of Tefiti I mentioned. There's got to be some other three-cost items. Let's, let's pull them up real quick. We'll do a quick little... Let's do types, items. Rarity is irrelevant. I mean, there are a lot of new items in this set. Granted, I, I don't know how if any of these are actually worth playing. Dragon Gem could be interesting if you're in like a support deck. She could play Sleepy's Flute. Lantern's a pretty good one. Again, yeah, you can't use them the turn they come in. But some of these, yeah, th that could be interesting. G the old spell book, that's a really good one to just cheat and to play for free. So, and we've got a bunch of the new items too. Fish Hook, I, I don't hate that at all. I actually really love the idea of her putting in Fish Hook. Or Field of Ice, that one's pretty interesting. So yeah, there, there are a lot of cool targets I think she could hit. Reese's Workshop, not that initial three you have to pay for this always feels like the hurdle you got to get over. Kind of same with Maui's Fish Hook. So there's a lot she could do. There are a lot of targets she has, and it, getting to play those for free is huge value. It's just like Jim Hawkins when you get to play the location for free. And I think this is going to be one of the more consistent ones too, because... If you're playing her, you're building a deck around items. Hopefully you don't run into that new Steel Song that just completely blows up all your items, but this seems quite good. Yeah, she could easily die to a fox or, you know, something, a hook with Rush at a pirate ship that kills her for three. So she might only get to do it one time, but man, if she gets to do it multiple times, that's going to feel pretty good. Like the Song Ariel, sure, she's going to whiff sometimes, and that's just kind of the case. A little unfortunate she has to exert herself to, to whiff, but the amount of value she gets, yeah. Again, those lists are a little tight, but maybe there is... You're just going to try something else entirely different to really fit this item style. So she seems quite strong. Next, we have Sapphire's Triton, Champion of Atlantica, a 9-cost inkable, 7-9 body, quest for 3, can be shifted for 6, is a Floodborne, imposing presence, opposing characters get minus 1 attack for each location you have in play. Man, I love the concept of this card, and I think they completely botched the execution of it. I just think it's too expensive. Again, assuming you're not shifting... You have to wait till turn 9 to play this. Turn 9 is the same as a Maleficent Dragon, which says kill any character on your opponent's board. This comes in at 9 and doesn't do anything. And it's conditional. You have to have locations for him to essentially have an effect. Otherwise, he's just a body. Like, you might as well be playing the Steel Goofy guy at that point because he quests for more and has better stats. So you have to have a bunch of locations for him to do anything. Now, that being said... If you could get a bunch of locations, because this is just a permanent effect, 
let's say you build some kind of Aurora deck that gives this guy wards so they can't target him, and you somehow get three or four locations in play, and you've got resist, or you've got stuff that protects your locations, like the Wall of China, I think, is one of them. And your, oppo- your, your opponent's characters just permanently have three less attack, four less attack, five less attack. That's insane. So if you can somehow line all that up, yeah, this card's absolutely bonkers. And that's just a crazy thing that's like, yeah, they permanently can't actually even attack you now. <laughs> they have to slowly try to get rid of your locations. That's cool. I definitely want to try that. Is that going to be competitively viable and realistic? No, I don't think so. Absolutely that in no way will that be competitively viable. Do I want to see it happen on Pixelborn once or twice for the memes? You betcha. Next, we have Donald Duck, our buccaneer. He's a four-cost inkable, three-four stat line, boarding party. During your turn, where this character banishes a character in a challenge, your other characters get plus one lore this turn, and he gets plus one, or he's one lore himself. I immediately, uh, when I first saw this, I just dismissed it outright. I was like, wow, this card's terrible. I can't believe this is a legendary. However... He is a pirate, which means if you have the Jolly Roger out, he has he can move to it for free, and he has Rush. That instantly makes me like him way better. Cards that feel like they want you to challenge, like the sooner that you can challenge, the better. Otherwise, again, turn four, you play Donald, and he just sits there and does nothing. But with the Jolly Roger, play him turn four, move him to the Jolly Roger, immediately kill something, and ideally give your other characters one lore. Now, granted, that's still asking... You need the Jolly Roger. You need other characters to quest in order to benefit from that. And Donald's stat line isn't amazing. Like, he's going to die to a goat or a fox, two very popular cards in the meta. So if he can live, if he can live, and so, like, let's say turn one, you do the Roger. Turn two, you do Smee. Turn three, you do John Silver. Turn four, Donald Duck. And multiple times he can kill something, which lets Smee quest for three and John Silver quest for, you know, what, two or three at that point, I guess, because he would have had the, the location in play. That actually could be really good. So I, I'm hoping that lines up. Again, this one seems a little easier to get online, but it is very reliant, I think, on having, having the Jolly Roger, because if you just play him for four and that's your whole turn, I think that feels pretty bad. And last, but certainly not least, probably least, who knows? No, there's probably a worse one than Piglet. So Piglet is Sturdy Swordsman, 5 cost, uninkable for some reason, 3-5 stat line, eh. Quest for 3, that's really good, and Resist plus 1, those are both really good. And then not so small anymore, while you have no cards in your hand, this character can challenge ready characters. Why? No, why? Why do you have to have no cards in hand to do that? Would it have been broken if he could just challenge ready characters? You can't shift him. So the earliest you can get him out is turn five. He's uninkable. So you, your whole entire turn five is you play Piglet and that's it. Like that's the only thing you can play from your hand that turn. And then he has to wait a whole turn. Yes, he has resist. So like he's kind of a soft six health body. And three attack is okay, but I, with no cards in hand, like that's well, that's such a downside. So I, I don't think you're actually going to use him to challenge much. If you were to play this card, I think you just use him to quest. But then I think if you're going to do that, why not just play the big Cinderella? She, yes, she's technically a seven, but she can shift on five. She's inkable. So if you see her early, she's not just a dead card in your hand. She has resist plus two. She can challenge based off a song, which fits way more with that theme. And she also has three, like, and she has a better stat line too at a five, five, like, Maybe that's not a fair comparison, but I, I think it is. And same with Robin Hood. Shifting big Robin Hood on turn three is huge. He's a three, six. Yeah, he only quests for two, but he has two insane effects that help him when challenging, and it doesn't require your hand to be empty. If anything, he helps fill up your hand when he dies. Like, in light of Steel's other options, I just cannot see why you would ever pick Piglet over one of those. That's going to do it for the legendary cards from Ursula's Return. I hope you enjoy the set. Look forward to some fun deck builds and ideas. I'll definitely try out on the channel because I said there's some fun stuff I want to try. We'll just see how good any any of it ends up being competitively. And if you are going to to a Lorcana challenge in Chicago or Atlanta, I hope you have a great time. I would love to go to Chicago, but unfortunately couldn't get a ticket. So if anyone knows ways to help me out, let me know because I would absolutely love to go. Enjoy the set. Have good polls in your pre-releases. And until next time. Take care.